Welcome to April 29th, 2066. 50 years from now, it's the end of the semester. Some things don't change. And a group of four students is studying for their final exams, putting together that final project. One of those students is in Minnesota, one of them is in China, one of them is in Norway, one of them is in Argentina. But they're not communicating by Facebook, whatever that was, Google, or anything like that. They're four avatars, each in each room around the world, using technology that lets them communicate in their native language and be understood by all four students. Good idea? Maybe, maybe not. Technology brings your study abroad experience into your room. Or consider 20 years from now, 2036, an eight-year-old girl is a math whiz, and she's truly adorable. This is a great picture of that little girl. She's a math whiz. She has a way to perceive mathematical formulas and understand them that is remarkable. MRI scans show that her brain has a special capacity to solve mathematical problems. And her parents, seizing on that opportunity, inform her school that they want her abilities enhanced. They want her to be the next Einstein. And the technology to do that is called transcranial direct current stimulation, TDCS for short. And research by then has shown that by patterning external signals into her brain, she can get a permanent, permanent cognitive boost. Not just five hour espresso drink or a little pill you take to help focus, permanent changes. Do you want to go there? And if so, how much do you want to go there? Do we want to communicate around the world using avatars and, and uh, artificial translation? Maybe. If that technology could solve the critical problems that are facing our ever complex world, maybe we do. But do we want to create a new class of super intelligent elites who are the products of performance enhancing stimulation? Maybe. But what if we could use that technology to aid students with reading, math, language, and other disabilities? Maybe. But who would get those chances? Will the disparities and opportunities gaps that exist now simply widen and create an even greater gap in our civilization between the haves and the have-nots? Or will those high-tech tools actually drive equity and diversity in the future? And I use the word future loosely. Look at this. For $22 on eBay, you can purchase a transcranial direct current stimulation device. You thought I might have made that up. You can buy them. There are 10 available. <laughs> As president of the university, I do not encourage you to go buy one of these. Now, my point is this. No matter what the technology, I believe the sustainability and the dynamics of this already vibrant place we call the University of Minnesota. The first speaker is a little confused about that. The University of Minnesota. <laughs> we have to come down on the side of humanity and healthy social interaction. Curiosity naturally awakens us and those around us, and this is a place driven by curiosity. In my view, the essence of education is human guidance, nurturing, and mentoring. Now, can teaching and learning here be done more efficiently? Of course it can. Can it be done more economically? I sure hope so. But here's what I know about the brain of young people between the ages of, say, 17 and 22, our prime undergraduate audience. Neurobehavioral scholars say that the plasticity of our brains and the efficiency of growing brain networks during that period of life is particularly acute. And it's even better than those formative first months of life because, believe it or not, teenager brains are more organized than those of infants. <laughs> now, I know this for a fact because 
I am the parent of two boys. Karen and I have two young men, wonderful young men now, but I'm telling you, when they finished high school, everybody wanted them to go to college. <laughs> it was time. That was nature's way of telling us it's time to go out on your own, develop and grow into wonderful human beings, which they did. And it turns out that if you think about the ways that we transform in our society, adolescence, uh, to productive young adults, there are really two major ways. One is higher education, the other is the military. Beyond that, you're sometimes on your own. That human interaction and the ability to educate transformed my career. I was a graduate student here, third year graduate student. Yeah, I, somebody might have to get fired for that. I don't know where that picture came from. <laughs> But that's how I looked, 1981. And uh, I was in my laboratory in Amundsen Hall, and my advisor, who was the head of the department, Ted Davis, some of you perhaps will remember Ted, terrific guy, uh, came into my laboratory. This was an unusual event. I think in the four years I was here, he was in my office three times. And of course, a graduate student knows that if the department head shows up in your office, it's either a really good thing or a really, really bad thing. And this was a good thing for me because Ted was putting together the teaching schedule for the fall quarter, it was back then, and someone had taken ill and couldn't fill a particular slot. And so he asked me if I would be willing to teach this class in process control. And I asked what every intelligent graduate student would ask under those conditions, which is how much does it pay? <laughs> and it paid more than I was getting paid to do research, so I said, sure. Now. What Ted did not ask me, and I didn't really feel it was important to share with him right then, was that at, at my undergraduate school at Caltech, um, there was a chemical engineering curriculum, but it was a little bit maybe not totally mainstream. And this class that I was going to teach process control, well, it actually wasn't in the curriculum at Caltech, so I never actually had a course in process control. I thought that was a... <laughs> a detail that I didn't need to bring up then. And uh, <laughs> I kept a couple of weeks ahead of the students. And it turns out that if you, if you uh, uh, teach process control, uh, it's oftentimes the course in applied mathematics, and I could do applied mathematics. So I had a, I had a great experience. The students seemed to nuffer, suffer no permanent harm. And I said to myself, this teaching thing is really great. And that experience of interacting with students, and I, I suspect many of you uh, have taught who are in the audience today, it's a wonderful engagement. I went on to an academic career. I have advised 37 PhD students in the course of my career. And each one of those experiences, that human contact, the opportunity to watch a young person come in as a fledgling scientist, struggle, grow, succeed, go out, and have a wonderful career, uh, on their own is extraordinarily rewarding. And it highlights to me the fact that as technology comes and we're able to do more in social media and we're able to connect with each other in different ways, that fundamental human-to-human -human interaction is not going to go away. Now, about the future. Prognosticators make all kinds of predictions about the future of higher education. Some are solid, positive, correct. Others are a little bit more fanciful and turn out to not be right. Certainly technology has enabled us to do things like flip classrooms, having students learn by watching uh, something online, coming back, sharing that knowledge, developing the ability to work together and communicate uh, in the classroom. Uh, the opportunities for active learning, the opportunities to use uh, online resources rather than expensive textbooks, personalized learning for those who are ahead of their classmates, all of that is real and is there. Some futurists have also predicted the end of facts, and so the promotion instead of simply learning how to learn. Some futurists are predicting that in the future we will have a personal hard drive or a robot that will keep track of facts for us, and we will need to know, know as many things as we know now. Personally, I'm a chemical engineer. I like facts, and I like to keep them in my brain, too. 
but other technologies. For example, this idea of a virtual tour of Rome, where, which is stunning to this young man. Um, <laughs> the opportunity to see the cityscape as it was then and is now. Very, very cool. So I do think technology is forcing us to get better at teaching and has great possibilities for economies of scale. But I do believe, I'm old-fashioned enough to believe, that bricks and mortar are not going to go away. Because look at that, or that. I don't think we're going away anytime soon. Let me give you an interesting little fact. If you consider how many organizations existed in 1530 and exist also today, there are 66 of those institutions. The Catholic, Catholic Church, the Lutheran Church, of course, parliaments of Iceland and the Isle of Man, and 62 universities. We change, we grow, we evolve, but at the end of the day, universities are remarkable for their historic continuity. And I expect the future of learning and teaching at this university will change and evolve. Technology will help us. Neuroscience and knowledge of the brain will help us know how to learn better. We have scholars on our campus in various disciplines studying exactly those problems and how the relationship between teachers and learners can change as time goes forward. They're looking for ways for teachers to connect more effectively with each student by identifying students' learning styles, by understanding how to intervene and how to guide more effectively. But as we apply technology to this problem, I'll close with where we began. Do we want to go there? The ethical questions, I think, are critical. Brain science is showing that there are many circuits committed to human interaction. There are regions of the brain that deal with fairness, with compassion, and understanding. For example, as Sona mentioned, our, mus our musician neighbor Prince died, and our community not only mourned together, we gathered together in the streets, and not just in Minneapolis, but Paris, New York, and London, and we peacefully honored him because of the way he touched us. It was about him, but it was also about us. Now, Prince did not touch us transcranially, I don't think, but in our hearts and our souls. And similarly, as a university and in higher education, we must embrace and promote one constant community of ideas, a community of humanity, always and always managing the technologies that we've created, ensuring that they promote the common good, whatever that future may bring. Thank you.